Okay, the next part we're moving on to today is secularization. Now, this is quite a lengthy topic area, and obviously take your time pausing the video when we're looking at tables, um, statistics, etc., just so that you get a full understanding as to what we are actually talking about this. Because secularization as a topic really encompasses a large majority within beliefs in society. What you should start to see when we discuss this is a lot of the areas start to become interlinked and connected with this particular topic. Now we're really going to get into a lot of information with this so there's about 27 slides we're going to get through so just bear with it, bear with this video and obviously break it up as we're going through. Now within my YouTube page I have actually uploaded this video so what you can do is watch this video and just get a rough idea as to what we're talking about in terms of secularization just so that you guys can start to understand what this actually means for us and how it's actually started to impact our society now the first part that we're looking at here today is defining secularization as an a sociological key term now, many sociologists have argued that the growth of scientific knowledge along with industrialization would lead to secularization, which is evidently just a natural step in terms of rational thought and progress. However, secularization has been defined in a variety of ways. So Brian Wilson in 1966 defined it as the process whereby religious thinking, practice and institutions lose social significance. Um, as a result of that, we can see that there would be a clear separation in terms of the church and the state. However, Steve Bruce in 2002 says that there is no one secularization theory. Rather, there are clusters of descriptions and explanations that cohere reasonably well, that therefore present an argument as to what is actually happening within our society. That with the decline of religiosity, that is simply just a trend in terms of identifying what is happening with secularization. Now, Jose Casanova here in 2003 distinguishes between two general approaches to defining secularization. Now, an emphasis on declining importance of religion in terms of social structure and the significance of religion in society generally. Now, this often involves the separation of religious life from the public sphere, so that becomes a private matter. So therefore, we see this increase of believing without belonging, that people are now worshipping at home and therefore gaining that deeper understanding. The second point here is using the term secularization now more narrowly to refer to the decline of religious belief and the practice amongst individuals as well. Now this is quite a simple point that we're looking at here. People are simply just no longer holding the religious belief and they're no longer practicing the rituals that are required by these religions which as a significant result we can argue it signifies the immense decline of religion. Now, Glock and Stark in 1969 argue that there are multitude aspects of secularization, part because there is no general agreement about what characteristics are truly religious societies. Now, different aspects of secularization will be dealt with individually, and they will not be this mass community based um, activity or epiphany that we once thought of when we look at secularization. Now, within this next section, we're going to look at how our classic theorists actually view secularization. What are they going to argue are really is happening in terms of the form secularization would take and what are the causes of secularization as well? Now, what we should see here as, as an example in terms of a positivist is Comte ha also believes scientific beliefs will gradually replace faith. Now that is the reason as to why he would argue secularization has occurred because this epiphany in terms of um, change of belief systems is happening because we're now turning towards more scientific belief systems as a result. Okay, we've got our three perspectives here, which is Marx, Durkheim and Weber. 
Now, Karl Marx is the first one that we're looking at, and he argues the cause of secularization is the eventual production of a communist society in which there were no classes. Now, the form secularization would take, he argues, is the complete disappearance of religion, which would no longer be needed because a communist infrastructure would be in place. As we know, and as we know, he argues that obviously within communism, there is no place for religion because a hierarchy in terms of bureaucracy um, would no longer be able to flourish because you have to have a capital system to do so. However, we know this is completely ludicrous because in Poland, um, underneath the communist regime, religion was still able to flourish and prosper. We've got Emil Durkheim next, and the cause of, of sectorization, he argues, is in the industrialization leading to a greater division of labor and a decline of mechanical solidarity. So this is based on similarity and an increase in organic solidarity. So this is based upon mutual interdependence. Now, the form sectorization would take for these individuals is the gradual reduction in the importance of religion for provide, provide, providing shared beliefs and therefore the integration of society. Now, education will partly take its place and obviously we can relate that back in terms of how religion would start to sap some of those um, institutions and they would lose its importance because it would start to farm out its skills to other places. So for example, the church used to be in charge of education, care, etc. Now it's farmed off to the NHS, it's farmed off to social workers, the education system, etc. Now religion would survive but become less functionally important as a result. So therefore it will not be the be all and end all to an individual's life because they realise how ludicrous that might be. Last one that we're going to look at is Max Weber. Now, the causes of secularization are the following. So, the rationalization of the modern world in which people become primarily concerned with planning and the most efficient ways of achieving their objectives. Remember, this is all about living an aesthetic lifestyle, which therefore means we're going to gain and earn our place in heaven as a result. Now, this would be caused by the development of science, the increasing importance of bureaucracy, organisations, and the rational, planned nature of capitalist society. Now, the form sectorization would take as a result is the gradual reduction in the importance of faith and the increased emphasis upon knowledge based on evidence and actions designed to achieve goals. So what we can see here are three very, very different perspectives from another. We've got conflict theorists and social change and conservative ideologies really being promoted through each one of these. They are demonstrating that secularization as a topic is extremely diverse. So therefore, when we're looking at trying to define secularization, it's near enough impossible because different theorists different writers, different perspectives, all see it as taking different stages and different forms within society. However, the one common theme within all of this is that it is simply the separation of church from the state and the individual. So we'll start to see a decline really starting to occur. Now, as linking into my previous point here, now religious participation, church attendance and, attendance and membership in the UK really is a good signifier as to is secularisation actually occurring? So researchers would, who emphasise the kind of religious belief and practice have used data relating to religious participation as evidence to support their case. So the 1851 church census of churches found that under 40% of the population attended church on a typical Sunday. In 2005, Brearley found that just 6.8% of adult population regularly attended church. However, between 1979 and 2005, attendance at Catholic, Anglican and United Reformed and Orthodox churches declined by nearly 50%. So what we start to see from these statistics is there is a huge decrease in terms of religious participation and potential religiosity amongst these groups. 
Um, in addition to this, between 1979 and 2005, attendance at free churches such as Methodists, Pentecostalists and New Churches declined by around 25%. And the attendance at special Christian ceremonies such as obviously um, Midnight Mass, etc. has declined rapidly. And in the 1930s, only 90% of children were baptised, but by 2000, this had dropped by 45% which is a huge reduction when we think about, you know, Church of England and Christianity is still the main backbone of UK society, as it were. Now, the decline in church membership has been uh, rapid as the decline in attendance for most Christian religions. However, the proportion of population belonging to non-Christian religions doubled between 1975 and 2000, and this was identified by Brearley in 2001. Now, we've just got to take a bit of time thinking about interpreting the evidence. So, most of the above evidence seems to suggest sectorisation is taking place, at least in the UK. However, there are question marks over the validity and reliability in the statistics. Now, this is something by which you have to consider, because if we're analysing statistics, actually how valid are they and how reliable are they? Are they providing a complete picture or only part of the picture? Now, just as a quick little reminder, validity means how true the data is, so i.e. how close the fit is between the data and reality. And reliability is defined as data is reliable if other researchers using identical methods would produce the same results. So we're going to have to look at these statistics and question this. If another researcher replicated this um, census or this research, would they get the same result? and how true is this data to real life as a result as well. Now, 19th century statistics pose problems because the standards of data collection may not meet contemporary standards of reliability. So therefore, if we replicated them now, we would not get the same results. Therefore, a big, big question mark is thrown right above this. Um, different criteria is now used to record membership in different religions and meanwhile in the past this was highly unreliable because it was left maybe to one or two people within the church and therefore if they had poor organisation none of the church records would be accurately representing how many people are going to this organisation. And UK statistics on church attendance are based upon annual surveys conducted on one day in November, which may not be typical of attendance at other times of the year. So therefore, we've got to take heed as to the time of year by which these actual data collections are done. Now, the validity of using attendance statistics as a way of measuring religiosity is open to question. So in the 19th century, people may have attended church as a sign of respectability without being truly religious. Today, people may attend church in order to get the children into church school, even if they do not hold any religious belief, because that is the best school in the area. So I will do whatever I can to ensure my child goes there and even if that means I fake being religious that is what I'll do. Furthermore today religion may be expressed in other ways it may have become more privatized with people practicing religion or developing their own beliefs away from the institutions themselves. The next part we're going to look at is religious religious participation outside of the UK. So if the theory of secularisation is applied globally, then evidence does not support it as it appears to in the UK. So in the USA, religious participation is much higher than most of Europe, with some 40% 40 um, 40 attending church regularly. Now, according to Brearley in 2001, 34.5% of the world population were Christian in 1990, and by 2000, this had declined only slightly to 33%. Now, the proportion has declined in Europe, but increased in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Now, Brearley also states that there has been a big increase in the proportion of the world who are Islamic. His figures suggest a small decline in the proportion of people who are atheists and therefore a small increase in the number of religious people in the world as a result. So therefore, what we conclude from this is actually people are starting to adopt these belief systems once again because they're looking to search and explore the world in a meaningful manner. 
Now, membership and attendance provide only one way of measuring religious belief, since people may be religious outside of the context of organised religion. However, when we look at this, we'll fall onto other ways of collecting data, such as opinion polls, to see how religious people actually are. Now, the opinion poll evidence does suggest that religious belief has declined. The table below, which we're going to look at on the next slide, it shows between 1947 to 2000, the belief in God declined substantially. Although general spiritual beliefs may have partly replaced more traditional beliefs in God. Now, this opinion poll evidence suggests something of a shift away from traditional religion towards more generalised spiritual beliefs. Now, this fits in with the ideas of Helis and Woodhead, by which they are looking in terms of turning towards these alternative belief systems because these mainstream religions no longer deal with what they are meant to be dealing with. Now, Steve Bruce in 2001, 2001 argues that those who say there is something there are not really expressing strong or significant beliefs. Therefore, the opinion poll data shows significant weakening of religious beliefs as a result. However, the 2001 census in Britain found that most of the population did profess to belong to a religion. Of those answering, and 92 chose to um, answer the question, 71% um, said that they were Christian, 2.7% said they were Muslim, 1% were Hindu, 0.6% Sikh, 0.5% Jewish, 0.3% Buddhist, and 0.3% other religions. Only 15.5% said that they had no religion. Therefore, from this data, we can conclude that actually people are religious. However, there are not, there is not a huge proportion of those who are seeming less religious as a result. So we need to be very careful when we're looking at this data and drawing this whole big truth that secularisation has occurred, when in fact this might not be the case. However, the validity of this data may be questioned since over 390,000 people stated that they were Jedis or Jedi Knights. Now, this was a whole internet conspiracy type thing um, by which people were asked to write this on a consensus so that people could start to claim tax breaks, etc. to try and um, explain their religious ideology. Also, many of those stating that their religion may have a very weak affiliation. In contrast, survey research in 2003 found that 41% said that they had no religion as a result. All right, the next section that we're going to move on to is religious pluralism. So some researchers imply that truly religious societies um, generally have one faith and one church. Um, this obviously provides um, that society with a set of norms and values which provide value consensus and that shared collective consciousness that the functionists often quite preach about. Now, this situation may be characterised in some small scale societies such as um, the study by which Durkheim conducted with the Australian Aborigines. Um, however, in modern industrial societies, religious pluralism and the existence of many religions is more typical to see in a society like this. And there's multiple reasons as to why this could happen. Now, the reasons as to why there will be a huge amount of religious pluralism could be a result of the sheer increase of technology and the accessibility of these various religions which exist within our society. Now, Bruce uh, is a supporter of the secularisation theory and he suggests that this creates a situation where religion is no longer a central feature of society but more a matter of personal choice. Now, Bruce claims that as a consequence, strong religion which dominates people's lives declines and, a large, and is largely replaced by weak religion which involves tolerance of different beliefs and has limited influence over people's lives. Now, for us here, we would argue that that would be the New Age movement as an example because as we know, the New Age movement as a whole um, general idea is less influential than that of mainstream religions such as Christianity. Now to Bruce, um, a fragmented and pluralistic society such as modern UK um, do not lend themselves to having religion that exercises a strong influence as a result. And as we can obviously see within our own society, religion has significantly declined in its importance. 
Um, however, critics of the secularization theory believe that religious pluralism is not incompatible with strong religious societies. So people may have different beliefs but hold them very strongly. So for example, in Northern Ireland, Christianity is more strongly followed than in England, even though there is a major division between Catholics and Protestants. And um, obviously that is a very interesting angle by which you could use as an evaluative point. As we know from the previous videos and discussions that we've had in lesson, ethnicity does have a huge role into play as to how much or how little do people believe in um, some religious entities. Now, on the face of it, minority ethnic groups in Britain seem to contradict the theory of secularisation because they appear to have a stronger religious beliefs than that of white British people. However, Steve Bruce again believes that greater participation is not the result of deep religious conviction but serves a particular function for minority ethnic and minority uh, migrant groups. Now, the various functions that the religion offers are going to be cultural events and cultural transition, by which we're going to look in more detail now. Now, cultural defence, this is where two communities are in conflict and have different beliefs. Religion becomes a way of asserting ethnic pride, similarly when a minority ethnic group feels some hostility from the wider society, religion can be a way of achieving community solidarity. So by way of forcing um, the general masses to follow one single um, religious dogma or doctrine. Now, the last one that we're looking at here is cultural transition. Now, this is where religion can also be useful, where people have to adjust their identity to deal with their change situation. So, for example, Asian and African Caribbean migrants to Britain can use mosques, temples and churches as centres for their communities. So, they, so that, as a result, they do not lose their um, cultural identity or um, identity from their homeland so they will hold on and cling to these religious communities because that is their last connection with their motherland or their main community. Now to Bruce these processes keep religion relevant but do not create a genuinely religious society. However Brown in 1992 disagrees and argues that ethnic defence is a crucial function of religion in the modern world and because it leads to a revival of religion and it creates more religious societies as a result of this. Now, Christside similarly finds little evidence of decline in religion amongst ethnic minorities. Few have abandoned their religion and become apostates. Instead, most have continued their religious beliefs with some accommodation to the change situation. Now, this is only part one of the secularization video, so I'm going to create the next one soon. Um, obviously, if you've got any questions, let me know.